On July 26, 1947, just a couple years after the Nazis' grand defeat, President Harry S. Truman signed the National Security Act into law, thus creating our favorite shadowy government entity, the CIA. Now, the very early years of the agency aren't really pertinent to us, and I'm sure there are better channels with better videos on that topic. But what we're going to do is zoom in on the hiring of an American chemist by the name of Sidney Gottlieb in 1951 thus making him the first person on the U.S. government payroll with the sole purpose of finding ways to control the human mind. A month or so after the hiring of Sidney Gottlieb, the CIA would launch Project Bluebird with the primary goal to determine whether a person could involuntarily be made to perform acts of assassination, give up valuable sabotage information, or generally anything else the agency wanted. So before this video gets flagged for sounding like some crazy conspiracy theory, I would like to bring up these partly redacted government documents publicly available thanks to the CIA Freedom of Information Act. The experiments using cocaine, heroin, peyote, mescaline, and even the old marijuana were definitely real, but not for all those weird reasons those lunatics on the internet want you to believe. You see, in 1951, the American government truly believed in its heart of hearts that the Russian and Chinese governments had not only discovered, but were using mind control on their citizens, and they believed America needed to catch up. That's it. So, Sidney Gottlieb, perhaps way too eager to verify his and the agency's beliefs, became hell-bent on cracking the code to mind control through illicit drug usage. Sadly, the experiments resulted in countless deaths and overdoses that we will probably never know about. What we do know, though, is that after Gottlieb had tried LSD for himself, the drug quickly became his favorite candidate for what he called the truth serum. By 1952, Gottlieb and his small troop of interrogators had taken the experiments from the black sites of Munich to the streets, offices, and prisons of America. With the influx of incredibly racist persecutions of black men, the CIA sought to drug prominent inmates to weaken their morale. In the bigger cities like San Francisco and New York, the CIA would employ prostitutes in an operation informally referred to as Operation Midnight Climax. For an objective look at the effects of LSD, the women would lure their uh, customers to a predetermined room where she would drug the guy and then step out, leaving the unsuspecting John locked in a room and recorded for observation for up to and exceeding 12 hours. All of these illegal acts were done under what the agency called a national security, but in the articles written looking back upon this time, actually call it more acts of paranoia than anything. You see, there was no doubt that the influence of communism taking over the American streets weighed heavy on the CIA and other government officials. And after capturing potential double agents in the field, the CIA would begin to drug its own employees. Gottlieb himself would instruct the dosing of an employee for 77 days straight to see if he was truly a double agent, thus rendering the potentially innocent man disillusional for the rest of his life. Ultimately, in 1953, just two years after his hiring, Gottlieb's reign of chemical control was done too much when an army bacteriologist by the name of Frank Olson would be dosed by Gottlieb himself, only to begin a week-long mental spiral that resulted with Olson jumping out a high-rise New York hotel room window. Now you might be thinking, Cool story, Mr. Narrator, bro, but I'm here for mushroom talk. Well, here's where an old acquaintance of ours comes into play. In 1955, just two years after the very public death of Frank Olson, the CIA would reach out to James A. Moore, a chemist that was kept in the agency's atmosphere after quietly helping them develop the first nuclear bombs during Project Manhattan. Moore was brought into the agency for his chemical knowledge, and perhaps even more importantly, his talent for keeping national secrets. So much so that by night he would do CIA business, but during the day he would appear as a mild-mannered assistant professor at the University of Delaware. This status in the college wasn't by accident though, cause it allowed Moore to order massive amounts of anesthetics, mescaline, and LSD without a trace for the CIA. But Moore himself wanted to experiment with something else, 
something undiscovered yet fabled. Something like the Divine Mushroom. You see, years prior to Moore's hiring, the CIA had learned about a professor and her banker husband who were taking frequent trips to Mexico in search of a mind-altering mushroom. So, just months after being hired, James Moore was given the task of finding the sacred mushroom before the American public could know about its existence. Yet, as Moore and his team continued to venture to the wrong parts of the dangerous Mexican jungles, Valentina and Aragorn Watson would inch closer and closer to discovery. Ultimately, an amateur couple and a friend would beat the CIA by a mile, not only discovering the divine mushroom, but actually trying it during an, an indigenous mushroom ceremony. So, since the CIA couldn't beat the Watsons, they decided to join them through a bunch of cleverly disguised grants that the couple happily took. Eventually, in 1956, one such grant program actually came with its own college chemist, a professor by the name of James A. Moore. How lucky. After integrating with the group and taking several trips to the outskirts of Huajuca de Jimenez, James Moore and the team would come up empty-handed. But eventually, Moore would return to the University of Delaware with the divine mushroom in hand for the CIA. Quickly, the fungus was sent to the agency's top chemist to synthesize whatever compound affected the mind. And sadly, after the psilocybin discovery, the unknowing public experiments had begun again. Now, because it's 2022 and we're all logical humans here, we know that the CIA, Russia, nor China had ever accomplished mind control, especially with the use of psychedelics. But who knows how many man hours and tax dollars went into this silly mission, not to mention the thousands of lives altered or even lost due to the CIA's public experimentation. In the end, the CIA allowed R. Gorton to publish his Discovery in Life magazine because their experiments failed. There was no way to control the mind with any certainty. And thus began the psychedelic 60s. With the mushrooms and shaman women well into public knowledge, the agency tried to wipe their hands of the operation. Well, until the mid 70s when the Senate would make them expose all their dangerous experiments to the American public. It wouldn't be until 1979 that the American public would see and hear from James Moore for the very first time. And luckily, I was able to find that broadcast for you. Please give that a watch and let me know your opinion about James Moore and the experiments that took place during the early times of psychedelics. Like and subscribe if you dig. And thanks for watching.